not others, and share our confession with another person. Step six and seven, in humility we seek help from God to cleanse us and fill us with new strength. Step eight and nine, we recognize the harm we've caused to others and take action to heal our damaged relationships. Step 10, we persevere in the training of the 12 steps in daily life. Step 11, consciousness of God's presence is with us always. Step 12, we give away what we have gained in our journey through these steps and remain in recovery in every encounter in life. All right, remain in it. Go to um, Matthew chapter 7. Remaining in recovery, though, is similar, to, is similar to what Jesus to his disciples said to his disciples in John 15, 5. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We cannot practice these principles of the 12 steps without being connected to him. So our priority is to apply these steps in any problem, event, situation, job, or relationship. In other words, to anything that life throws at us. When we connect to Jesus by deepening our conscious contact, he enables us to live more effectively, responsibly, and joyously. Amen? So we understand that the steps help get us ready to accept somebody else to control our lives, which is God. Okay? When we get to step 12, we let God, God is in control of our lives. We clean out the garbage. We're learning about God. We're trying to practice these principles in all our affairs. And we're not being so short-sighted as we would before we got to this process. So look what it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Is everybody there? All right, it talks about the golden rule. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. So everything in the Bible is taught, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So when you clean out the garbage of your life and you start thinking about others now, you can start treating others the same way that you would want to get treated. And this principle is in your mind circulating all the time. And this is a very difficult place. Even Christians and people that do the step work find themselves in selfish states of mind when situations come in their life still. Instead of thinking like, well, how would I want to get treated in this circumstance? Somebody did this to me or hurt me or disrespected me. Wouldn't I want them to be gracious to me and forgive me? This is how I'm supposed to act to them now. And this is the principle that we is supposed to be circulating in our minds. But it's not that easy. It, it, we think that we got there until a situation happens and we get selfish again and self-centered and our sin nature comes out. Amen? We can agree to that, right? And Jesus, you know, it just, it, this tells us when we go to verse 13 how narrow the gate is. You see, we have to understand. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Just like we just talked about, right? Noah preaching, only eight people got in the boat. Caleb and Joshua, the only two that got in the promised land. Because the road to obedience that really leads to life is difficult. Believing in Jesus to get to heaven is the easy part. Living the life that God saved us to live is the difficult part, and this is the process that we learn in the steps. We understand that we can't live this life without, apart from God. Apart from me, we can do nothing. So we need him in our lives, and we need his word circulating in our minds, in our everyday circumstances, so we can apply the golden rule. So the whole Bible is summed up into do unto others you love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But it's saying love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And that's the journey that we get on. It's like, all right, we love God, but do we love him completely with our whole heart, whole soul? And this is the process of doing the step work, helps us to clear out the worldliness in our heads, in our hearts, and puts us on the road to life, which is God's ways. And once we, just think about when you treat somebody with respect after they disrespected you, just like Jesus would want you to do. Say, all right, give them a break. Be respectful to them. When you do that, you're actually practicing the principles of this program in all your affairs, and you're applying the principles of the Bible. See, you're getting rid of the principles of the world, and you're applying the, the principles of the world. Is why That's where we arrive at step 12. 
where we can actually apply God's word to our lives instead of our word. How hard is that? The Bible says how hard it is. Very, very few ever find that path. That's why this room is in full right now. Because the gateway that leads to life requires us to go to the cross. And this is why we were talking about Saturday, about the resurrection. They talk about going to the cross all the time, but they don't really talk about the resurrected life that much that we're supposed to live after we get saved. We're supposed to live a resurrected life down here, not till we get to heaven. So we do this step where it helps us to live that resurrected life. We are born again. We are spiritually awakened. So in other words, what's circulating in our mind now is the spirit of God's word instead of the spirit of the flesh. And that's the process that we struggle with all the time. That's why it's so difficult. And everybody struggles and thinks it's an overnight process. It's a journey. Little by slow, we start getting rid of them old behaviors, and it takes time to leave them behind. Can I get an amen for that? But we're on a journey, and we want to leave them behind. That's how you know you have the Holy Spirit living in you. You want to get rid of them behaviors, because when you act up on it, it's like, ugh. You know? We don't beat ourselves up. We just recognize our sinfulness now. And it's, it's just wide awake, and we just hate it. I know that, you know, you know me and you know, my wife, you know, I just got to throw this in there, that she's with me all the time. And it's like, to practice the principles, when you have a history with somebody, is different than somebody that you meet in the market that you don't know, that just like cut you off in the aisle or, you know, put their carriage in front of you. They're just having a bad day. But somebody you have a history with, and, and then you have to like forgive, forget about all that and, and treat them like you'd want to treat somebody else is a hard thing. I'm learning that. But at home is where I have to practice this more than anywhere else because that's the real, that's the real place to do it. Because when you can do it at home, you can do it anywhere. You know what I mean? And that's... And, I, and, I, and, it's only, and it's not that God's beating me up. It's just showing me that, you know, you're just not as far along as you think you are. Because if, you if you're as far along as Jesus was, Jesus didn't say, okay, because I know you that good, I don't have to be as nice to you because I remember what you did to me. He's nice to, Jesus was nice to the Pharisees. He, was, he said he was nice to the people putting nails in his hands. That's where the principles of this program and all our affairs and this lifelong journey in which we need is grace and mercy to continue doing. It's a narrow road. Let's go to um, John chapter 14. Jesus said, when two or three are gathered, I'm with you. It doesn't really matter who's here. It matters that we're here. Amen. And the word is going forth and we're getting out there on a live feed. In a little while, we're going to have other people joining in with us that are going to be here. And it's going to, it's going to be a great thing. So. John, 14? John 14, yeah. I'm going to read verse 1. Jesus, the way to the Father. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and also trust in me. Now, before I even go any further... Belief is one thing, trust is another. We have to understand that. I use the example of this all the time. There's a guy with a high wire going across Niagara Falls in a wheelbarrow. And he's going back and forth in that wheelbarrow. And you see him five or six, seven times doing it. And I ask you, and if I tell you, can you believe that guy can go across that high wire with the wheelbarrow? You'll tell me yes because you've seen him do it five or six times. You believe he can do it, correct? Now he says, get in it. Do you trust me to bring you across in it? You see the difference? Belief is, uh, is one thing. Trust has to be developed in someone. That's why we believe in Jesus first, and then we start to trust in him later. And that's what it's saying right here. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and also trust in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that. I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I'll come and get you. <laughs> Jesus is going to come get us. So that you'll always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. And they say in here, no, we don't know, Lord. Thomas said, we have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus told them, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would really know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. As Jesus was just explaining his deity right there. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. See, they still, look what they're saying. Show us the Father. They're still, Jesus is right in front of them. We were watching it like yesterday. Jesus was performing miracles right in front of them. And he's saying, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. <laughs> Jesus replied, I have been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. So you could be saying, I could be, I've been reading the Bible this long, and I still don't know who. You search the scriptures because you think they give you a tell. All the scriptures point to me, Jesus said. You search the scriptures, but you still don't know me. So why are you asking me to show him to you, he says. If anyone who, look, he says, anyone who has seen me has seen, my, seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. So after you get to step 12, the words that you're speaking are not yours anymore. They're the words of God now. That's how people can see Jesus. You understand? By being humble and patient and kind. Now look what it says. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. Just imagine, Jesus trying to say, you've seen everything I did, at least believe. This is what I just did, nobody ever done that. And just think about your life. Nobody's ever done what Jesus has done for you. This is why step 12 is so important to tell people about Jesus. Not just about the steps, it's to be telling people about Jesus took me along this journey through the step work to clean myself out and put himself in me. It was Jesus that did the work, not me. Amen? This is why step 12 is so important, to be truthful. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with my Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. So Jesus said, I'm going to go to my Father, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. See, we have the Holy Spirit as Jesus is with us right now because Jesus is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is God. So we have the Trinity. Jesus is with us and he's in us and he wants to live through us. But the thing of it is, we believe that. But do we trust him with the issues in our life out there to where we can actually be his representative and speak the very words that he tells us to speak as we go through that? And that's where this process comes in. We know the difference between what we speak and we know the words of God. So we know in step 12 that when we're giving somebody a break that it's really not us giving them a break, it's God, because we don't give people breaks in the flesh. That's how you know the Father is in you. It's, it's evidence. That, that's why it says having a spiritual awakening or a spiritual aware, awareness as a result of these steps, knowing that that's not me doing this, by the way. My flesh does not produce that kind of stuff. It's God who produced it in me. So you can actually see the difference. All right, we're going to go to step 12 now, sharing together. Look at John chapter 15. Go to page 1367. Step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Since we have worked through the 12 steps, we are in a special position to carry the message to others. We can recognize the warning signs of addictive compulsive tendencies in those around us as well in our, as in ourselves. When touching on such deep and sensitive issues, it is important to speak in the language of love, not condemnation. The Bible tells us that if someone is overcome by some sin, you who are godly or spiritual should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, Obey the law of Christ, which is in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. 
You see, it's telling you to share each, bear each other's burdens. Look at it says, the command was the one Jesus, the one Jesus taught his disciples. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. John 13, 34. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. Chapter 15, verse 12 to 13. We're going to read 15. We are not the Savior, but we can love others as he has loved us. Love goes beyond mere words. Sometimes it is spoken in silence when we don't condemn someone who comes to us looking for help. Love doesn't just tell them what the problems are. It helps carry the weight of their burdens. We can be part of a support network to help carry our friends until they are able to take the steps towards recovery on their own initiative. Amen. This is what... This is the process. When we get to this, like, there's not very many people that do this, right? We're in the process. But we are in the position to help. In other words, when somebody that's, that hasn't done this, we're supposed to be beacons of light for people. And we're not supposed to fall into the same category as that. We're supposed to be like Jesus, where we, we're forgiven and they don't understand what we understand. And we're supposed to go down there and share that burden with them and bring them on board with us. But they're not supposed to bring this with them. We're supposed to bring them to us. You see, now, by how do you do that? By showing the love of Jesus Christ. By doing this work. And that's a process. And that's why it's so important that we do this work so we can be a beacon of light for the lost and dying world and people who might not have done this that want to get on the journey and we can show them that there's a better way. Amen? It's so important. All right, let's read um, chapter 15. Jesus, the true vine. He explains the step work right here. I'm the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by what? The message. You see it? By the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So you can say, okay, I'm going to do this, the 12 steps, but I'm not doing this. So you just disconnected from the power that got you to them steps to begin with. Amen? You can't, you can't go to this and then put this down. He says, you have to stay connected to me. So we have to go through this process again and again and again, and we have to stay in this book again and again and again so we can actually get this.
thought it would be a phone. Anyway, we're almost done anyway. Okay, so look what it says. I'm the vine and you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, see what it says? If my words remain in you, look what it says. You may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. So if God's words are remaining in you, the things that you're asking for are lining up with his will. Because the very words of God are what are in you, and you're asking for the right things. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. I have loved you, even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other the same way I have loved you. Now, as we read the Bible, we really understand the real, how, G, how much Jesus really loves us. Enough to go to the cross, pay our sin debt in full. We really get to know that unconditional love. Amen? Amen? We get to know it as we learn his word. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. So how do you know you're doing this process of Jesus? You're putting your life aside for other people. Amen. That's how you know. When you're saying, I'm saying no to what I want to do, and I'm saying yes to what God wants me to do, and that's to serve him and be of service to his people. Amen. Amen? And that's the process of the 12 steps, because once you get there, you want to help people now. Yeah. My friends, if you, if you do what I command, look what it says. I will no longer call you slaves, because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. You are not my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. Look what it says in verse 16. You didn't choose me, I chose you. <laughs> mm. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. So that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Now here's the, here's the kicker right here. The world's hatred. Mm -hmm. this, is the process, this is the problem. Now, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. Yep. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. You see, when we come out of the world, just like when we talk about this thing going on out there, right? We're starting to trust God and we're still doing what we do. The world gets all like twisted about mm -hmm. it. That you're not, you're, you're like, we're doing what God tells us to do. What's, what, and, and, and people get all twisted because we don't belong to the world anymore. We belong to God. And whatever he does, he does. And so we just live our lives and we're not scared of that stuff anymore. And it makes people mad. What's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. What's wrong? No, what's wrong with you? You just don't, you just don't understand. Mm -hmm. You don't understand the principles of life. That God's the one who really sent it. Let me tell you something. God's the one who's going to take it away. In his time, in his way. Yep. And we understand that, so that's why we live the way we live. Mm -hmm. We're not so petrified of it. Yep. And that, the world hates that kind of behavior. They think we're crazy. Yep. But it says it hates you. So to remember what I told you. A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they'll persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they will listen to you. They will do this because they'll do this to you because of me. For they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as it is, they've seen everything I did, yet they still hate me in my father. Mm -hmm. This fulfills what is written in the scriptures, they hated me without cause. So when you when you shine, listen, when you shine, when you're like Jesus over here, they're gonna hate you. They're gonna hate you because it shines light on them. And that's why the Christian world doesn't show that kind of light. And that's why it's not hated, because nobody's shining that kind of light. Yes. 
because they're not purifying themselves with God's word and actually obeying it. Mm -hmm. They just, what they call playing church. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing what really God saved them to do. To be a beacon of light and build this kingdom down here, amen? amen? But there's a few of us that understand that and we're still going to continue doing it, amen? amen? And that's why we're here, amen? amen. Alright, so we're going to stop there. We're going to answer some questions. I think you want me to share that with you. God is good and uh, we're going to get a phone call from yep. our sister.